Hello, and welcome to the Market Bull Podcast. Please note, topics and stocks discussed in this podcast are not financial or investment advice. Today on the show, I spoke with Derek Graham, the CEO of Portal Asset Management, which is a hedge fund that allows investors to gain access to digital assets. He is also the co-host of the Beyond Bitcoin podcast. On the show, Derek discussed in depth what blockchain is, how it is used, the current developments, and where it could be applied in business. Derek looked at the potential barriers to the growing sector and what threat the blockchain presents to traditional institutions. I hope you enjoy listening. Hello and welcome to the Market Bull podcast. I'm your host, Ben Kostrich. And joining me today on the show is Derek Graham, the CEO of Portal Asset Management and also the host or co-host of Beyond Bitcoin. Welcome to the show, Derek. Hey, thanks very much for being along, Ben. I'm delighted to be here. It's uh, the the whole world of cryptos and non-fungible tokens and just the whole decentralized community really is, is an area that I'm looking to explore more. And, and I can imagine for yourself, this probably wouldn't have been where you saw yourself going into uh, as the years have gone on. So, I mean, talk about your history and, and where you came from and, and even how you got into the digital world of, of cryptocurrencies sure. and, and that. Sure. Well, actually, I came from a fairly traditional background of technology companies. Um, I have um, listed, co-listed, supported listed four different tech companies over the years onto the Australian Securities Exchange, and they've been involved with um, biotech, um, advanced composites, civil aviation, and um, and uh, engineering. And so technology has always been a fascination for me, um, but I've also got an absolute passion for cars. Okay. which is kind of like my life hack. <laughs> and I run a thing called Classic Cars and Coffee. And Classic Cars and Coffee meets at the University of Western Australia on the first Sunday of every month. And it's been going now for six years. And on a sunny day, we'll get 800 cars and four to 5,000 people turn up to look at these classic cars. So we'll fill all of car park number three, which is where the Reed Library is, yep. all the way through past the tavern, all the way up to the business school, car park number nine. Um, and we'll fill them all with cars. And I looked at that and I thought to myself, these classic cars are fabulous things. And you get to hear stories like, like, like you know, there's a 911, um, mid-70s 911 Targa that has got Boat One Sonny Bono stuck up on the side of mm. it. Well, it was Sonny Bono's car. Sonny and Cher used to drive around LA in that car. And all of a sudden, of course, that car's worth more. So I looked at developing a way of transferring providence, history, authenticity of an asset. And in 2017, early 2017, someone said, you should stamp that on a blockchain. And mm. I said, what's a blockchain? Okay, okay great. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a good segue because that's the, that's the crux of everyone's confusion with the sector. What is a blockchain? Well, a blockchain is an immutable um, accounting system that doesn't require a third party to validate it. It's run by a set of algorithms. And I might use some really simple analogy to describe how it works because I met the inventor of a blockchain, and that wasn't Satoshi Nakamoto. He was the inventor of Bitcoin. Mm. This is an absolutely charming man, um, and he is a, um, he's a mathematician out of upstate New York City. And, um, and, and I met Scott um, and started to communicate with him and flew him out to Australia and, and let him lecture and talk with different, to different groups. And... He said that he was working for um, Bell, Bell um, uh, Telephony at the time in the, in the early 90s. And um, they were running a, a tax system that basically said they just kept on employing um, research guys because it made them money to employ them. And so he had nothing to do. And he said, I've got this problem. And that is, I don't know whether this JPEG is the original JPEG or this JPEG mm. is the original JPEG. 1993, no internet, remember? We're just yeah. taking JPEG photographs. And um, so he went away with, a, with another fellow called Stuart Harbour. And Scott Stonetta and Stuart Harbour spent three months trying to prove that you could work out a way of doing it that couldn't. Then they spent three months trying to prove that you couldn't do it. And then one day, he was standing in a queue at a Wendy's cafe. And if you've been to the US, there's lots of them. Yeah. And he was in a queue and he went, ah, I got it. And he My worked fault. out that... In front of him, there was a person and another person and another person and a cashier. And everybody in the restaurant saw them. What he did is he transposed that. He turned around and said, the cashier is the Genesis token. 
the next person is the next block of data, then the next person is the next block of data, and all these people in this restaurant are computers, and they're validating every block of data. And by doing that, every block of data is filled with data, and every piece of data has a 64-digit hashtag on it. You change one pixel in one photograph in one block of data 300 blocks further on, and it doesn't work. Interesting. And so therefore, blockchain became a way of, of decentralizing the authenticity and the providence of each transaction, which gets laid down into a block, and after a certain number of blocks get linked by a chain to the next block, and each block has a hashtag on it, and every bit of data inside has a hashtag, hash on it. Sorry, not hashtag, mm. hash on it. And so what you've then got is you've got this indelible accounting system, which is real-time, totally available for interpretation, interrogation, doesn't require an auditor, doesn't require any third-party institution, bank, accounting group, government to validate it because the computers are doing it. Mm. So in the case of Bitcoin, which nearly 20 years later was developed by Satoshi Nakamoto, who cited Scott Stornetta and Stuart Harbour the whole way through his white paper, he put a currency on top of it. And the currency's transaction was validated by the underlying blockchain that Dr. Scott Stornetta developed. Ah, uh, because that's the whole, you almost say Bitcoin uh, is what transcended and made you know blockchain mainstream. It's what really gave everyone attraction to, to the commodity and or even... The, I don't even know really how to phrase it, but the, the yes. asset of, of what it is. But yes. it all comes down to yeah, authenticating and, and proving ownership and, and as you said, validating proof of proof of work. Or I know there's a whole different ways of, of validating if it's authentic or not. But I mean, f from that point of view and, and knowing what the blockchain is to then going into your role now as, as the CEO of, of the company that you're running, Portable Asset, Portable Asset Management. I, I mean, what, what company is that and how, and how do you utilize blockchain within that? Sure. So we've jumped a long way into, into the Portal Digital Fund and Portal Asset Management. Um, and maybe I'll explain that in a moment. Yeah. But the journey there was to turn around and say, well, wait a sec, this is an extraordinary space. And within two weeks of learning about what a blockchain was, I was on an airplane. And I, I flew to Europe and I visited six of the main conferences throughout Europe. Then I flew to America. I did the same there. I was absolutely mesmerized because I realized that this is the most tectonic technology I had seen to date. Way more important mm. than the internet because the internet was the internet of information, whereas blockchain and what's getting developed upon it is the internet of value and the transfer and transactions of value. And so from that, I realized that Bitcoin is fascinating, but in fact, it's just a prototype. It's the very first mm. ever currency that operates on an algorithmic basis utilizing a blockchain as its validation system. Wonderful. And it's gone through a number of forks, which I, which, which are met, which are changes in its, its, bro its growth. And you'll see Bitcoin Cash and other things. They're early versions of Bitcoin. And so it's evolved, but it's still just this, this methodology of storing wealth and transacting. People often make the mistake of thinking, that's what crypto assets and cryptocurrencies are. It's not. That's just one crypto cryptocurrency yeah. or one crypto asset. So if you look at this realm of crypto assets and cryptocurrencies, it's actually the fifth asset class ever. And it's the first asset class for about 300 years. Yes. In fact, it was the Dutch that created equities. Um, and so it's the first asset class with equities. We look at assets being being um, being cash, being um, real estate, um, being commodities, being stores of wealth, gold, and now digital assets because they're different to any mm. other asset class, right? So within digital assets, you get things such as utility tokens. And utility tokens are the algorithmic outcome that generates profit out of algorithms. So if you're running a decentralized exchange and they're swapping between tokens and sm very small commissions paid, those commissions are reflected in the utility token ownership, a little bit like, but not like, a share in a company. And so utility tokens, are, there's a lot of utility tokens doing all sorts of things from doing margin lending 
to transactions and, and decentralized exchanges to, you know, just all sorts of transactional environments are getting generated by utility tokens. It's fascinating. And then you've got things like um, security tokens, which are just either representations of digital assets or they're representations of physical assets, often called real world assets. Um, it's highly likely that, that trillions of dollars of real world assets will be put onto digital tokens over the next decade, not over the next 20 or 30 years, over the next decade. And the reason why is, why wouldn't you want a smart contract owning a company or owning a, your house or owning a commercial piece of real estate when it has all the providence of the house company or real estate? It has the ability to transact. You don't have to hand it to the bank, or if you do, the bank will become part of the custodian position on it, right? You are the bearer of the asset, not someone else. And, and you can transact it instantaneously across the globe to another country and another person without huge amounts of paperwork and bureaucracy and something that's associated with it. So when you look at digital assets, you're looking at currency, you're looking at utility tokens, and you're looking at securities, all digitized. Some look like equities, look like real estate, but reflected in digital. Some don't act anything like equities and real estate because they're algorithm driven. And so with that environment, I think went, well, wow, how do you possibly invest in this space? Well, I did what everyone does. I bought some Bitcoin. Right? <laughs> yep, naturally, naturally. It's, it's the gateway drug to digital assets, right? And then the very next one is Ethereum, which is vastly different to Bitcoin. Mm. And people often just interchange them. They're very different creatures. Ethereum is, in fact, a smart contract platform. If you look at it this way, you look at it like a sovereign state, like Singapore. And if you're sitting on a ship and you're looking at Singapore, you look at Singapore and you go, well, I can see buildings, cars, roads, cafes, restaurants, businesses. Um, I can see real estate and I can see, I can see exchanges. And I can... That's what operates on top of Ethereum. All of those things I mentioned operate on top of Ethereum. Real estate is getting transacted. Exchanges are getting transactions. Money is getting um, lent. All of this is happening on smart contract driven basis on top of Ethereum. Then there's Polkadot, Avalanche, many others. These are all sovereign states of blockchains that actually operate slightly different to each other because they provide different qualities depending on the requirement. And so when I look at the landscape and I look at blockchains, I always look at them as sovereign states. And then I say, what is getting built in them? Well, Ethereum is earning a huge amount of money, like $500 million a half year. Yeah. Um, and so Ethereum's got a massive community that's getting built on it. Um, and then within that community, you can start looking at DEXs, decentralized exchanges on Ethereum, et cetera, et cetera. You can do the same on the others. Um, and so then I looked through, I said, right, so I, I was heavily, I, I'm, I'm, Down the he rabbit hole I'm heavy into Ethereum. I, yeah. I think Ethereum is exceptional and I have some Bitcoin. Um, I went down the rabbit hole in early 2017. Then DeFi, decentralized finance, didn't even exist. So you imagine how much more exciting it is now. Yeah. Um, so it's really progressed. What people often get confused about is they say, like, there's 10,000 of these things. No, no, there's 10,000 digital representations of something, of which probably 7,000 of them are meme coins that someone's made. Mm. And it doesn't matter because you get to know that very quickly and they become irrelevant. Um, and then you think, well, there's going to be a million in due course. And the answer is yes, because why would you have a company exclusively listed on the Australian Securities Exchange in this siloed world of Australia where only the Bloomberg terminals out of New York are trading into it when you could possibly put your company on a smart contract and digitize it and have people buy 75 cents worth of it out of Africa? Yeah, you open know, up the pathways and access correct. to it. Correct, totally decentralize and democratize the world of, of assets. How many listed companies are there worldwide? 680,000. There'll be a million tokens out there over the next five years, plus, plus. It doesn't matter. They're just digital representations of an asset. So then that feeds into my question then, is what, why is the hesitancy or even, clearly there is a lot of work going underneath with, with Ethereum building out systems, but has there, what, in, your, in your opinion, why do you think there's been a hesitancy, almost lackluster approach to it? Because clearly there'd be, as we all know, institutions mm. that don't want this to happen because it negates entire current business flows. So, so where do you think 
Or why do you think there's been this sort of slow adoption or is it the complete opposite from, from being within the industry? So that's a really good question. Um, and here's a few answers for it. So number one, um, the world of crypto assets has no friend. It doesn't have a friend of a government friend. Yeah. Right. So, so during a financial crisis, you'll know on the ABC radio, they're all telling you, hold on to your superannuation. Don't sell your stock. Keep holding on. It's time in the market that's the most mm. important thing, not timing the market, right? Yes. Blah, blah. That's all propaganda. That's all the system trying to keep the existing equities in place. So the American banks are falling over. And so the American government stepped in and said, oh, we'll underwrite them to this mm. amount of money. Australia says, we'll underwrite our banks to 200. That doesn't happen in digital assets. Something falls over, it falls over. If something has been hacked, it collapses. However, it gets rebuilt really quickly. It's stronger, faster, better, smarter every single time. Whereas our, in our structure here, the banks, they're not getting stronger, smarter, no. faster. <laughs> no, we're they're not that every day, because yeah. they just get propped up. And if you look at how the banking system works, particularly out of the US where, where they're forced to buy bonds, et cetera, like that, um, and you know, the interest rate changes, the bonds become worth a fraction of what they were. They have a run on the bank because their assets banking, the cash is not there not your cash anyway, it's the bank's cash, um, then all of a sudden it collapses. Well, every 15 damn years it collapses. Mm. It's been doing it Perhaps for a long cycle. time. Yeah. And, and, and yet it has a lot of friends that support it, if I can use that term, friends. Yeah, Crypto doesn't correct. have friends. Yeah. Right? So number one is it doesn't have friends and government support. Um, number two is that, um, is that currently it's getting attacked by the US government. Um, and they're attacking it with a higher level of aggression through the SEC, the Security Exchange Commission's SEC Act of 1934, 89-year-old act relating to equities post the Great Depression. How relevant is it to crypto assets? Not. So they're trying to put these round pegs in square holes, um, but they're using a lot of might to do it. Why are they doing that? Two reasons. Their banking system is under threat by digital assets, because, and I'll explain why some of the advantages of it in a moment, um, but most importantly for them, their reserve currency is under threat. The entire digital asset community is worth a trillion dollars. It's nothing, it's irrelevant. It's not the size of it, it's not the price of it. It's the fact that you can transact a token across the country or across this table instantaneously with no bank and no government involved. Mm. This is problematic for the US government. So they have seen crypto assets and decided this is a problem for us. And in the last 12 months, since Biden's release of March 2022, when he did a presidential executive order to, to, to see what, you know, how to review this sector, um, it's been under attack. Meanwhile, it's growing at an extraordinary rapid rate in Dubai, Switzerland, Singapore, Hong Kong. These are London. These are nations that are banking nations. And the banking nations are going, we don't care about the US reserve currency. No. We care about doing business fast, efficiently, and effectively. And so they're adopt so it's like a two speed economy that's occurring. And then finally, yes, the institutions are under threat. Um, many of them are working out how to adapt and utilize the technology. Even the ANZ Bank is looking at creating an ANZ Bank um, sort of Australian digital, Australian dollar digital token. Good. Um, but the problem is that if they truly adopt all of it, they'll gut their structure. And, and that is a real problem. So this progression of removing this institution, the institutional rent takers, these aren't bad people. No. This is just how the current structure works. Removing the institutional rent takers is not well welcomed. So one, two, three groups don't like what's happening. However, it's so incredibly fast, so efficient, so effective that it is naturally growing. And, and that's what we're seeing occur along the way. It, 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 the whole concept and, and how this is being rolled out, you can see all the applications. But I mean, being in your shoes, where are you seeing the, the primary use cases for blockchain being rolled out? And, and you mentioned a few countries before, and I know that there are countries out there that have already almost adopted the use of, mm. of currencies to exchange goods and services. But I mean, where else can you see this technology being rolled out and, and utilized within uh, not just Australia, but around different countries and, and around the Absolutely. world? Absolutely. So Ben, you and I are sitting on the 45th floor at CPS Capital's boardroom here with a fantastic view. And, uh, and they're operating in a well-known exchange, the Australian Securities Exchange, and they're using 
Westpac or NAB, et cetera, all good infrastructures. Everything works here. Not the same in Africa, not the same in Vietnam, not the same in India, not the same in so many countries around the world. Doesn't work anywhere near like it works here. Even really not the same in America in many cases. So we've got to move ourselves out of this spot. The number one user of cryptocurrency in the world is Vietnam, followed very closely by India. Possibly now India's number one. The fourth biggest user of cryptocurrency, and we're not talking about investors or traders, but users of it, is Ukraine. Of mm. course they're using it because their banking system's in trouble. They're moving money overseas and across borders. Of course, the seventh biggest unit is Russia. They're doing the same thing for different uh. reasons, right? The eighth biggest user in the world is China, where it's banned. Interesting. Because they can't ban it. It's decentralized. Yeah. You can't stop it, right? America's the fifth biggest user. Australia doesn't rank in the top 20. And so where it's getting used is where it needs to be used, where banking infrastructure isn't well-placed, where people want to actually do business internationally off their phone and be able to receive money instantaneously or do a digital transaction or transact a digital piece of asset, something that they can do on their phone. Um, and also demographically, Vietnam's young. So is India. So they're oh embracing it. They're on it already. And so that's what we're seeing happen. And what we'll see is those economies will move forward at a fairly rapid rate because they're adopting this democratized um, way of being able to get digital assets transacted around the world. Um, so Australia will be a late follower. Um, to In this. a lot of... We, yeah. we, we're pretty good at doing that, sort of following the trend, seeing if it's, if it's working, if it's being utilized, and then we're always typically a few years down the track, which... I mean, going back to, to portal asset management yeah. uh, and, just, and just the company, I mean, where did you even come up with the idea or even see the opportunity to dive into that and starting that company? Well, you know, as I described, there's a lot of digital assets out there. And I hold a cross-section of about 20 digital assets. I've researched them a great deal. I like them. I'm a hodler, a holder of mm. these digital assets, right? This is a complicated process and they're very volatile. And I looked at this and said, there's got to be a better way for a family office or a small institution investing in this space. How do you reduce volatility out of That's the space. That's the key, the volatility. It, volatility. Yeah. And, and we realize that volatility is not loss. Pop, people often look at volatility and panic. No, no, volatility is opportunity. Exiting is permanent loss. So you need to be able to in a, be in a market for a period of time knowing it's volatile. But also we need to monitor the volatility. So we started the Portal Digital Fund, which is a Cayman Island-based um, hedge fund where 85% of all hedge funds are based in the Cayman Islands, um, managed out of Singapore, um, and our company is based in Singapore too. I live in Australia. Our CIO lives in Zurich. Our CTO, Chief Technology Officer, lives in Austin, Texas. Our data scientist lives in New York City. Our researcher lives in Sydney. And we're managed out of Singapore. And we have an advisor in, in Vancouver. And so our investors, the last four investors came from Switzerland. We have some investors in Australia, a few in Perth, family and friends. Um, and then we have plenty out of Singapore, um, some in London, and we're just starting to open a feeder fund into America to start investment in America. Truly, truly global. And so, and decentralized, so to speak, right? Um, but we needed to offer these guys something that they feel they could put in a portfolio rather than just think it's a gambling shot and let's, yeah. let's have some fun. So what we did is we developed a fund of hedge funds. And about a third, we have about 10 funds that we've invested in. We have 10 funds we've invested. We'll take it to 12 probably. About a third of those funds have a long but hedged position in a thesis that has invested into the, into the asset class. So let's say they'll have a good spread of decentralized finance tokens and exchanges. Then they'll have another one will have a good spread of layer one protocols. It's another word for blockchains, right? Um, and then another one will be investing in Web 3.0, relatively slightly uncorrelated, but long in the space. So about a third mm, of yeah. us is long in the space. About a third is in high frequency trading and arbitrage. These guys are trading in nanoseconds or seconds and minutes, a whole variety of time sequence trading. And they'll earn pretty consistently 1% to 3% a month. Um, and so they're pretty much consistent, but they won't shoot the lights out, although many people will think 25% random is shooting the lights out, right? Um, they won't shoot the lights out, but they're pretty good. 
and about a third are in sentiment and momentum. So I call that the other side of the barbell, or I call it the parachute, because when momentum and sentiment are going in a certain direction, you're generating return out of it. If the market's going sideways, they're making no money. Right? But if the market is rapidly going up, they're going to be generating return because they're following momentum and they're following the sentiment of the market. If the market is rapidly going down, they're doing that too. That's when the parachute comes out. They're earning that 5 7% for the month. Um, and whereas the other guys might be dropping 15% for the month. So by the time you balance all this out, um, since inception, we've earned an average of 33% a, a, a per annum um, over that period of time. Very so three return. years, solid yeah. return yeah. on a volatility of about 25%. So since inception, so not on, on the ends calculated along the way, um, we've had a sharp ratio of nearly 3.59. If you look at the sharp ratio now, it looks like close to one to one, but over a period of time, it has been very high. So these are just indicators showing we're managing volatility, we're getting solid returns. Yes, we get about we get about um, half of the downside, and we get about two thirds to three quarters of the upside. Um, but when you've got a market that goes up, down, down up, all down, different yeah. directions. So we've outperformed the top thirty tokens over the last three years, the index, and we've outperformed until January. We outperformed Bitcoin for the last three years. Far out. <clears throat> we don't intend to. We just have. Yeah. Because of the strategy. So an investor can turn around and say, look. This is a volatility of 25%. I've got a vol a professional investor. I've got a volatility sector in my in my um, portfolio, modern portfolio theory, um, that that I'm prepared to put 5% of my 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 portfolio in something that does 25, 30% vol. Yeah. And then we just become an item to go into the portfolio. They get shares in the hedge fund. They don't own any tokens. They don't get exposure to the wallet. Um, they don't have to worry about learning about the tech. They just look towards saying over a three to five year period, I should expect 25 to 30% per annum. That's what we built as the first fund. And then we built an index fund, which is pretty simple. Top 25 tokens, less stable coins, reweighted monthly, simple index funds called Horizon. And then we built Radiance Fund. And Radiance is, Radiance is actually sleeves up. We do the work on Radiance. So it's the very best tokens in each sector. Layer one, Layer 2, Web 3.0, gaming, metaverse, decentralized finance. Each one of these sections are, are interchangeable and interconnected, but they're separate sections. So we look at the best of the tokens in each and we buy two or three in each sector. And then about 30% of the funds are relatively early stage. Mike, they may be 90 days old, 120 days old um, on the exchange. And we'll look into those and think, you know, is there a unicorn there? And, um, and so ultimately, our goal there is to outperform the market um, on, on a fraction of its volatility um, and, and give people direct exposure into it. We invest directly in the tokens. That fund is also a Cayman Island fund run out of London. Fair cop. Well, I mean, there's a, there's a lot to digest yeah, there. Yeah, there's but, a lot. I'm yeah, sorry. But no, no, it's good because <laughs> it all boils back to me, the idea of how do you even approach digital assets and, yes. and even doing the research. And I mean, yes. in your position, I mean, I mean, where do you even start or, or where do you look for to get that information? Or as you said, is it because you're analyzing the blockchain and the foundations of the certain digital asset and therefore you, you believe that is a good one? I mean, how do you even start looking at all these opportunities that are out there? Because... I think it goes without saying the investment in this area has only been increasing, mm. even though you could say the top line news and headlines is potentially geared against it. Mm. There's definitely money streams going into these yes. sectors. How do you go about analyzing it and, and finding yes. the right education or, or viewpoints in it? Well, I guess the first thing is don't be fooled by price. So if the market dropped as it did last year, nearly 70 odd percent. So by the way, so did Netflix and so did Facebook. And yeah, all the big companies. All the big companies did. But nonetheless, the market dropped 70%. That doesn't mean the market's not worth, it's now only worth 30%. No, the price is 30%. What's happening in the market is still getting booming ahead. There's still development occurring and there's still expansion all around the place. There's still countries and companies adopting the technology, et cetera, et cetera. Just because the price changes doesn't mean the tech isn't getting developed. And that's the first thing to understand. Um, the second thing is don't be overwhelmed. It feels a little bit like drinking from a fire hose to begin with. You're thinking, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, geez, that's you a know? bit. <laughs> and then you oh, no, that's just too hard. Just start with reading what Bitcoin does and how blockchain works. Everything is in Bitcoin, but it's a start. Right? 
And then you'll start going, well, wait a sec, this, this is algorithmic. There's no bank, there's no government involved with this. In fact, no one can really stop this. This is really extraordinary. There's 110 million investors in Bitcoin. Well, there's not 110 million investors in gold. They might have it hanging around their neck, but they're not investing in it. And so it's a huge investment community. Metcalfe's law cuts in and it's still growing on upon itself, etc. And so you go, okay, so this is, this is interesting. So this is a blockchain, which is just an accounting system, and it's got a currency on top of it. Right. Okay, get it. So what's Ethereum? So Ethereum is this kind of, in, this kind of world of, of um, layer one, in other words, the transaction layer, which all these applications called digital apps, dApps, are getting operated from. So what's a digital app? Well, a digital app is an app that we would otherwise probably normally use or we might used to be using, but it operates in a world which is run by an accounting system and is run by algorithms and a smart contract. It's a smart contract. Well, a smart contract is a set of conditions like a normal contract that if this, then that trigger. Oh, wait a sec. So that means that if there's an accounting system that's operating a smart contract, then if you had a GPS tracker connected to a container that was getting transported from Johannesburg to to Perth, after a certain longitude and latitude, it could go click and the smart contract could be advised and payment can be made. Yes. Ah. And all of a sudden you start going, wait a sec, if this, then that. And, and, you know, I did a margin loan on some stock some time ago. Everything went faultlessly well. I knew the company well. It took a month, four sets of wet signatures, went to New York City, the lot. I can do a margin loan on Bitcoin in 60 seconds, and then I can undo it in 60 seconds. Why would you ever have margin lenders like banks sitting in between when you can do... Taking the time and taking the resources yeah. and delaying Wake up it. tomorrow morning, change your mind about the margin loan. So the power of decentralized, algorithm-driven um, in you know, uh, DeFi, decentralized finance, is so immensely stronger than something that a centralized organization can do. Microtransactions, a bank won't be there. In the future, when you'll see Web 3.0, which is just the next generation of web, it's a great term that everyone uses. Yeah. Um, it's just the next generation of web, which tends to, it tends to enable people to generate income out of something. So... Um, as an example of Web 3.0, um, we, we look at our phones and I've got 64 gigs of data. There'll be half a terabyte fairly soon. Um, I don't use all of that. I can easily say I don't need 50% of that. I can use a token like Filecoin. Filecoin will carve off 50% of that and that will give it to a third party that wants to store data. It's encoded in my phone and machine coding. I could never see what it is. It's irrelevant, right? And there'll be a duplication of it in another 20 or 30 phones or whatever it happens to be all around the world. But all of a sudden, edge computing all around the world, your laptop, this phone, um, everything around the world that's not getting used can start getting used for data instead of AWS. Mm, so right? the cloud instead of all those big Correct. manufacturers or not manufacturers, hosters. And my phone isn't charging you air conditioning and electric fees, which is what is happening at the hostess. So how do I get paid? I get paid in Filecoin tokens. A lot, maybe not, doesn't matter. Who cares? It's not but I'm not you. using it anyway. Exactly, so... I'm not using it. So in a Web3 environment, it's giving you these little microtransactions of Filecoins, right? And that's getting done on a blockchain. And if I want to get that done, there's no way a bank's going to be paying me Filecoin because they're all microtransactions. It'll all be done using a smart contract algorithm that's paying me Web 3.0. The bank won't be there. They won't be doing any of that. And that enables people to empower them for all sorts of worlds where their equipment, their know-how, their abilities will be charged and they will generate the income without a middleman such as YouTube generating, um, you know, taking 30% of the action. All right. Well, it's that whole idea of returning ownership and, and profitability back to the individual instead of, yeah, as you said, third parties, intermediaries. And I mean, a point that I really want to touch on quickly is the idea of volatility because, yes. I mean, for some reason, it's <clears throat> just assumed or even shown that the digital assets are more volatile and, and that's are. almost an argument to, to dictate that. Is, is that all related to, as you said before, that the, the backing like with traditional... Banks, you've got the, the governments that will bail you out. And, and as we were saying before, is that all feeding into why some of these assets are so volatile? And then, I mean, going from, from a person and actually immersing yourself in that, what sort of 
assumptions or guidance can you get for for or do you just have to take the ball and be like there is going to be volatility i just need to, yes. to handle that so if if you're prepared to hodl as the saying goes which actually stands for hold on for dear life um and if you're prepared to hodl um then um you know you might buy bitcoin um and you know if you bought it five years ago um then you would have paid thousand bucks for it um and now it's only worth twenty seven thousand not bad in five years. Not bad. It was worth 69000 So if you want to focus on that, it's mm. worth far less than it was worth, right? But it's worth 27000 not 1000 And so you basically have to ride out the volatility over a period of time. That's, so that's a base philosophy. Or you invest in the Portal Digital Fund, which manages volatility, um, utilizing you know, its various um, uh, you know, hedge methodologies. Um, so that's a couple of ways of managing the volatility. Why is it volatile? There's a couple of reasons it's volatile. One is that it's a truly, truly 24-7 global market. Virtually nothing is. And that which is a 24-7 global market, maybe like doing foreign exchange, is operated off Bloomberg terminals, not guys' phones. This space is operating 24-7 off guys' phones. If there's a panic and it starts dropping in value, two things happen. The algorithms start cutting in and selling. So it goes sell, 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 mm. sell. And it just keeps selling down because the algorithms are cutting in on the shorts, right? Um, or, or on the stop losses, number one. Number two, there's no government that says, ah, the market's a bit stop overheated. It. Let's just stop yeah. this, yeah. right? And number three is the market doesn't close at four o'clock in the afternoon. Everyone goes home for a beer and has a bit of chat about it, cools down. It never closes. It continues. It continues. So therefore, everything is exaggerated in this very young asset class. And volatility is one of those exaggerated things. Yeah, I, I think that is the key. It is still in its infancy stage. And, yes. and drawing back to the beginning where you're saying even the founders, you know, the, just before 2000, before Y2K, I mean, clearly it's come a, a long way since since even then. And, and, and I always look to it, yeah, currencies in particular, the idea that you have to buy a certain currency and therefore you lose your own value transferring Australia to US this completely eliminates all of that. It's yeah. a centralized coin that you can use anywhere and it's determined by the people. It suddenly eliminates a lot of control from people all across the world and, and you can really see that there's a hesitancy from, yes. from governments and there's a whole probably other subject about, you know, governments now trying to create their own digital coin and digital CBDCs. currency. Yeah, which is in a way, it, I, I think it's going to be quite terrifying. We'll see how it all yeah. unfolds. Um, but I mean, this has been, I can happily say like the tip of the iceberg in regards to digital assets and, and this world of, of decentralized technologies and, mm. and the blockchain. So for listeners that want to learn more a about yourself and, and, and digital portal or portal asset management, I keep stuffing up the words, apologies, <laughs> where, where can they go? And, and of course you've got your podcast. I mean, what, what sort of content do you cover in that? So, um, beyond Bitcoin, which often talks about Bitcoin. Um, Beyond Bitcoin is a show between I and Nitin Gower. And Nitin Gower is the head of digital assets at State Street. And State Street's one of the biggest banks in the world. And so he's extraordinary. And he and I discuss banter, dissect the news yes. on a weekly basis. Um, and we'll deep dive sectors of it that we think are really intriguing. The other day we did meme coins because the Pepe coin went to you know 5 million percent. Mm. Who was behind it? Why did it do it? What's happening with meme coins? How does a mean coin, what is a mean coin? Those are the sort of things we'll discuss and banter between ourselves. 30, 35 minutes comes out Thursday. It's called Beyond Bitcoin and it's on all podcast platforms and YouTube. That's one way of doing it. Yeah. Um, the other way of doing it is, you know, Portal Digital Fund. We have Portal Asset Management is a website, so you can always go there. We have a reference center that's got all of our blog posts and backgrounds and research, Bitcoin white paper, things like that. Um, and of course, they're always welcome to reach out and say hello. I'm delighted to chat to people. Um, D e r y c k, difficult spelling. D e r y c k at portal am and um, and say hello. You can find me on LinkedIn and and uh, and all the other social media platforms. Well, as we said, there's so much clear to dissect in this sector, and and clearly, it's there's been sort of rocky stages I can imagine between the inception of the fund, and 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 I can see I've been on the website. There's a lot of information on there, so. Thank you for shedding a, a brief insight into this sector because I know that even in the next handful of months, it's all going to evolve and I'm sure yes. that, yeah, you'll be covering all of this on your show. But yeah, thank you for taking the time to speak with me on, on the Markable podcast and, and share your insights into the sector because I think yeah, there's something that's coming and, and investors and just 
people looking to to improve and utilize new technologies really need to be exposed to this so yeah thank you for sharing your information with me today most welcome ben delighted to chat about it thanks for listening to the marketable podcast if you enjoyed it please make sure to like and subscribe you can follow the market bull on our socials at twitter and linkedin by searching the market bull you can also subscribe to our newsletter on the website by visiting www.themarketbull.com.au